why did we choose that psalm, Psalm 90 then? I'll tell you why. There's two reasons. One, it speaks a bit about people suffering, doesn't it? About people having sorrow. Principally because they've not done things they should be doing in God's sight and God has brought sorrow on them. But the other reason for, re to, for, for reading that psalm is because if I'd used some of the other references I wanted to use, it would have compromised the ideas I've got coming later on. So there was a twofold thing with that. First of all, let me ask you a question, and feel free to answer, because we're going to write the answers on the board. What is human suffering? What constitutes human suffering? Just throw out some of the ideas, things that people suffer from. Toothache. Oh, toothache, right, yeah. Okay. H-E. H-E. Right. I nearly wrote Acre then. <laughs> Come on, some, some others? Sorry? Illness. Illness, yeah. Children. <laughs> Whatever, most people think of those as a blessing, so we'll not write that on. Death. Death? Well, do people who are dead suffer? No. That's a good one, isn't it? Because once, once a person's dead, their suffering is over, we say. Some other things people suffer, causes of suffering? Poverty. Sorry? Poverty. Poverty. I'm glad you said that, Keith, because that is one of the things I've got on my list. Yeah? Loss. 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 Yes, that will come under illness, wouldn't it? But, yeah, good one. Because that's a Bible one, isn't it? Yes? Loneliness. 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 <coughs> Depression. Hunger. Can't write sideways very well, but I don't want to block the... Right. Hunger. Sorry? Hunger. Hunger. Right. Something else associated with hunger that is perhaps more on a national scale. Famine, thank you. Somebody else said something then? War. war, thank you. Yeah, very important one. People suffer in wars, don't they? Right, any more? Pain. Pain, pain thank you. One of my main subjects, that one, pain. Right? Old age. Age. Fine. But it's... Is old age necessarily suffering? Some people who are elderly are quite happy. Obviously, when you get ill, then you're suffering from illness, and you're unhappy and you're suffering, aren't you? Sorry? Well, possibly, yes. <laughs> I haven't met many of those, though. Right, well, there's, there's quite a few. I'll show you one of the two of the things that I put on my list, if this works properly. We've got disease, famine, poverty, war... Terrorism. I was expecting that one to come up. Crime. People <coughs> suffer from crime. They're victims of crime, aren't they? Marriage breakdown. Think of families that suffer when marriages break up and parents disappear and the children are having to be shuttled between one and another uh, and divorce proceedings and things that cause so much suffering in our current modern age. Pain, as uh, Helen said. Accidents. Bereavement. I mean, we didn't get that one, did we? Did we? Yes, we, I suppose we did in, under the... Because there's other people suffer when somebody dies, isn't it? Um, financial insecurity, very popular... At the, well, it's not popular, but you know what I mean. <laughs> <laughs> financial insecurity is something that's affecting all of the world at the present time, and people do suffer. When somebody loses a good job, and suddenly they've got no money coming in, how are they going to keep up their lifestyle? And the answer is, they can't. Natural disasters, there's earthquakes, there's volcanoes, hurricanes, floods, forest fires. And we think of those in America at the present time. All sorts of things that happen. And of course it was this time of year, back in 2004, wasn't it, when that huge tsunami swept across Indonesia and killed so many people. Right, so those are some of the ways in which people suffer. Human people, uh, people and humans suffer. Um, let's have a few pictures and then see if we've got some of those. What would that relate to? Famine, wouldn't it? Famine, where people have got no food. 
And for us to go hungry, we know that we shall find food at some point in the very near food mm. future. But for people who have absolutely nothing, and there's no prospect of them getting anything, they die of hunger, <coughs> dreadfully. So there are pictures we see on our news screens all the time of, of people who are suffering through hunger and famine. Think of people like Bob Geldof, 20 odd years ago, did the Live Aid concerts to try and raise money. What good did it do? He's back on television this last year or so saying it had no effect. Everything gone back the same as it was before. And he was, he was very angry about that. So there's suffering on famine. Uh, and some dreadful pictures that you've seen probably on, on, on the news. War, right? We, we, have, we have war, we have people using modern sophisticated machinery in order to impose their will upon others, and as a result, people die. And here we have, all right, the, the gravestones that are, related, that are shown there relate to the people who were fighting the war. But most of those soldiers didn't go voluntarily. They went because they were soldiers and they were forced to go to war. And the generals and commanders of their armies said they would do certain things and it meant that they died. And it wasn't just them that suffered dreadfully in the, those are from the First World War um, the, at Verdun in France. And of course across Belgium and France there are many, many scenes like that of hundreds of thousands of people who died on all sides. And people suffered, not just themselves in the war, but their families who had to deal with the fact that their loved ones were no longer there. I've been there. Uh, it's a very harrowing experience to go to that Holocaust Museum. Uh, in fact, I can't even talk about it now, thinking about what we saw and heard when we were in Israel in 1995. But that is the sculpture at the entrance which commemorates the dreadful suffering, human suffering, that the Jewish and Israeli people suffered during the, the years 1933 to 1945. Uh, and that museum is in Jerusalem, and you can visit it. As I say, it, it is quite harrowing. Human suffering, it's, it's when hearts are torn apart for all manner of reasons. And I, th I think that aptly describes disease, if you like, how, how diseases and illnesses with people can result in, in, in people dying and suffering very badly. Cancer cells. Cancer is one of the biggest killers on our planet <coughs> today. Uh, and people are trying to fight to overcome uh, the, the cancers and diseases that there are. It's not just cancer, but many other diseases. What's going on there? What, what aspect have we got? We haven't actually got it there, have we? It's crime that that one relates to. That people suffer when crime occurs in, in all manner of ways. And, of course, terrorism. That was on our list, wasn't it? Not on that one, but on my list. Uh, who can forget that event that occurred when so many people died and so many families across the planet were torn apart? The London bombings in July 2005. It's one of those places where you know where you were when you heard the news. We were on the last but one day of a holiday in Cornwall. Uh, John and Alan are on Peter and Mary. I think Peter and Mary were about Padstow when we got the news. Uh, on their way back home for, for some reason. Um, but uh, they didn't disagree with the holiday and left us. You know, they had something to do back in Bristol. But when we heard that news, it's like the death of President Kennedy. Those who were alive at the time remember what they were doing. And, and we do ourselves, don't we? Poverty. People suffering. Great hardship because they've lost their job. They have no means to find work. And they grab a shopping trolley and fill everything they've got. And that's where they live. That's how they live. Dreadful poverty. Bereavement when loved ones die suddenly and we lay them to rest in a grave and we're not going to see them again. Well, some people will, of course, because they have a hope which will come to later. But that was another one. It was Helen, I think, said pain. 
People suffer when they have pain uh, and all sorts of ways in which that expresses itself. Accidents. Accidents happen, the news is brought to families and the people involved and their families suffer much suffering over what happens and of course pain again. When we break limbs and we have to wait for them to heal, we suffer. And our title is Human Suffering, When Will It End? This goes on to hurricanes and natural disasters. You see what happens when this is what's called a pyroclastic flow, where a volcano sends <coughs> ash and gas down a mountainside, sometimes at speeds of over 70 miles an hour, and it wipes everything living out of its path. And when volcanoes explode with all the violence that they explode with, the lava can come and destroy decades of work that people have put into building their homes. I think the next one, yes, that, that man built his home. It took him about 30 years of, of building and, and gradually making his home. And he saw the whole lot disappear in a couple of hours. And they were absolutely beside themselves with grief over the fact of all that work and they had nothing to show for it. And of course, earthquakes. This is the one, I think, in China just this last year. When such devastation occurred, I can't remember the name of, of the city where it was. I guess John and Jill would probably uh, remember the name of that. I, I'm not sure whether you went there. Are John and Jill here? Yes? Oh, yeah. Did you go to that city at all? Do you remember what the name was? No, I can't remember. It began with an S. But um, it's one of the largest cities in China. No, it wasn't Shanghai. It's right in the middle of China. And, of course, that was our introductory. That was a picture of people who had lost everything, including members of their family. Very, very sad. Right. So, what can be done about it? Let's take famine as an example. What could we do to alleviate famine? Anybody? How would we alleviate famine? Sorry? Give people food, yes. But when you're talking on a national scale, does that work? It doesn't, does it? I mean, Bob Geldof proved that. They raised millions and millions of pounds and sent the food out to Africa. And the countries they were trying to help, literally, the government took the food away and wouldn't let the people have it. They feathered their own nests, as we would say. And they looked after themselves. And there was a lot said about the fact that the food that was made to go to, sent out to people who were starving to death, very often didn't get there. And that's the problem, because people are greedy. People will do what they want to do, and they will look after themselves and their families, and if others suffer, they will let it happen. Not so much in this country, I suppose. Uh, we don't have that level of suffering and famine. But in some of these African countries and across the world, people do suffer deprivation, not because the food isn't there, but because it's not allowed to get to the people. Uh, and that happens time and again, not just in famine, but in war. I mean, look at what's been going on in the Democratic Republic of Congo. They say any, any nation that's got the word democratic in its title as a nation really isn't. It's, it's usually a despot ruling. But, but that's another issue. But so many times these things happen... And what I was trying to pull out there is the fact that no matter how hard we try to put the things right that are with the world, there are so many problems, there is so much suffering, we can't achieve it because the rest of the world will not pull together. And that is human nature. That is something we've learned to live with over the centuries, over the millennia uh, that man has been on this world. And it has always been like that, because man always has been and always will be fallible, and because he is greedy, he is evil, he is selfish, and any other amount of adjectives you'd like to put behind that idea. There is only one person who can and will put these things right, who will solve all these areas of human suffering. And I'm sure some of the children can tell me who that person is. 
Who can put all, those, all this suffering right? Jesus, thank you, yes. Jesus, who is the Son of God, who is not fallible like we are. Because Jesus has been made immortal. And Jesus is alive today, more alive today than he was just over 2,000 years ago when he came onto, into this planet. Because he is no longer mortal, he is immortal because his father raised him from the dead and has given him everlasting life. And that is the key to where suffering will have its end. You see, God has promised us that Jesus will come back and that ultimately he will bring peace and righteousness and safety to this world. And I, I use that word ultimately quite deliberately because human suffering does not suddenly end, zap, when Jesus comes back. How do we know that? Because of verses like this when Jesus returns. The Lord shall go forth and fight against those nations uh, as when he fought in the day of battle. Uh, and that is something that Zechariah is telling us in, the, in his 14th chapter. That in verses 1 and 2 of Zechariah chapter 14, we are told how the nations of this world have declared war on God's people, that is Israel. And then in verses 3 and 4, we read those words followed by his, and we understand that to mean Jesus, his feet shall stand in that day upon the Mount of Olives, which is before Jerusalem on the east, and the Mount of Olives shall cleave in the midst thereof, toward the east and toward the west. That incidentally tells us that that hasn't happened yet, because the Mount of Olives is still one mountain. And there shall be a very great valley, and half of the mountains shall be removed toward the north, and half toward the south. And ye shall flee, speaking to these nations who have come against God's people, you shall flee to the valley of the mountains, for the valley of the mountains shall reach to Azal. Yea, ye shall flee, like as you fled before the earthquake in the days of Uzziah, king of Judah. And the Lord my God shall come, and all the saints with thee. Right. And Zechariah in that 14th chapter of his prophecy in the Old Testament goes on to show how the Lord will bring peace to Jerusalem and to his people and ultimately to the rest of the world. If you go on to verse 12, we read, This shall be the plague wherewith the Lord will smite all the people that have fought against Jerusalem. Their flesh shall consume away while they stand on their feet, and their eyes shall consume away in their holes, and their tongues shall consume away in their mouth. Well, that doesn't sound very much like an end to human suffering, does it? Far from it. It sounds as though they're suffering more than they ever did. <coughs> because God is causing these people who come against his chosen people to suffer very badly. And this is at a time when Jesus returns. So you see why I say that suffering doesn't suddenly go zap, stopped. And everybody's at peace. And everybody breathes a sigh of relief and says, oh, at last. There will be people who say, oh, at last, when Jesus comes back. And those are the people who know what this wonderful book tells us about what is going to happen in the future. You see, we need Jesus to come back and save the world from itself. No matter what Gordon Brown said last week about saving the world, Jesus is the one who will save the world. And he will take us through to a time when there is peace and safety and security. The question is, when will that be? What does the Bible tell us will happen when Jesus comes back? Well, I've got a series of references now. Uh, it does tell us that the process is going to be gradual, but eventually all people will come to worship God and that Jesus will reign as king over all the earth. That is what is promised. But I've got a series of references to show that process and how things will happen. Not necessarily sequentially in the reference, but just pick some references out of the Bible and we'll have a look and see what's said. Famine. How about famine? How would Jesus conquer 
and, and, and resolve the problem across the world with famine. Well, let's have a look at a reference in Psalm 72. Would one of the children like to come out and read this verse? All right, Daniel, if you'd like to come and read Psalm 72 and just verse 17, 16. There are many other verses in these Psalms, by the way, which we could read. Uh, Psalm 72 and verse 16. There shall be a handful of corn in the earth upon the top of the mountains. The, th the fruit thereof shall make, shall shake like Lebanon, Lebanon, and they, sh and they, and they of the city shall flourish like grass of the earth. Thank you, Daniel. Right. So that's what the Psalm 72 says. It says a lot more about what Jesus will do when he comes back. But when we think about famine, there'll be a handful of corn in the top of the mountains. There'll be, well, it doesn't just say that, it says there'll be an abundance of food for everybody, doesn't it? That's what's implied in that verse. Who'd like to read Micah chapter 4 and verse 4? But they shall set every man under his vine and under his fig tree, and none shall make them afraid, for the, for the mouth of the Lord of hosts has spoken it. Thank you, Emily. You see, the Bible tells us there'll be a time when people don't have to be afraid of other people. They can get on with their own agriculture, and nobody will molest them and make them afraid. These are some of the things that God says he will achieve when he sends Jesus back. How about war? Some references that tell us what will happen about war. Right. Isaiah chapter 2, verses 3 and 4. Who would like to read that? And many people shall go and say, Come ye and let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, and he will teach us of, of his ways. And we will walk into his paths, for out of Zion shall go forth the law and the word of God from Jerusalem and he shall judge among the nations and shall rebuke many people and they shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks nations shall not lift up swords against nation neither shall they learn war anymore right thank you Emily isn't that, isn't that a wonderful chapter which talks about when Jesus comes back, he will abolish war. People will turn their sophisticated weapons of war into items of agriculture. They need them to grow corn on the tops of mountains and out in the desert, as Isaiah 35 says. Let's look at Isaiah chapter 9 and verse 7. Anybody? Of the increase of his government and peace, there shall be no end upon the throne of David and upon his kingdom to order it and to establish it with judgment and with, ju and with justice from henceforth uh, even forever. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. Thank you, Daniel. There are, see, it's not just going to be for a short period of time. As I said, it's going to be forever. When human suffering has its end, it will be an end, not just a temporary break, but it will be forever the peace that Jesus brings. I think I've got another one under this one. Isaiah chapter 32, verse 17. One of the adults perhaps like to read this. And the work of righteousness shall be peace, and the effect of righteousness, quietness, and assurance forever. Thank you. Again, that word forever. Wonderful word, because it means it's not going to come to an end. And that's what happens when we read about God's kingdom. Uh, in Daniel chapter 2 is, is a classic example, that God will set up a kingdom that shall never be destroyed. Right. Pain. How about pain? I've got three verses here. Revelation chapter 7, verse 17 for the Lamb which is in the midst of the throne shall feed them, and shall lead them unto living fountains of waters, and God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. That's God's promise. Uh, Jesus is relating the message to John, his faithful disciple uh, in Revelation, and he's saying what is going to happen. God will wipe away all tears from their eyes. 
Look at Isaiah chapter 35 and the last verse. So just picking a few of the verses that we could use, there are very, very many more. My Bible won't let me turn the pages quickly. The ransomed of the Lord shall return and come to Zion with songs and everlasting joy upon their heads. They shall obtain joy and gladness and sorrow and sighing shall flee away. This whole chapter is about the promise of God's kingdom to come and those who will enjoy it forever. And finally, on this one, I think it's Revelation 21. I'm going to ask Auntie Helen to read this one because she actually gave us a quote about pain, didn't she? You can stay there, Helen, and uh, just read that out for us. Revelation 21, verses 3 and 4. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Now the dwelling of God is with men, and he will live with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death, or mourning, crying, or pain, for the old order of things must be made. Thank you. Uh, isn't that a wonderful verse which says about the peace that ultimately will come? When Jesus comes back, there were a lot of things to put right. And still people, mortal people, will continue to suffer for a period of time. But gradually, Jesus will put right the things that are wrong with this world and the things that are wrong with people. Until there comes a time when everyone on the planet will respect and know God. And they will come to Jerusalem to worship him. But when? You see, that's the question, isn't it? It's human suffering. When will it end? When will these things happen? That's the question people wanted to know from Jesus. And he said, no man knows that. God will send me back, he says, at a time in the future. And not even me or the angels know when. But there are clues I can give you, he says. Clues that you can look for. And when you see these things happen, then know ye, he says, that the kingdom of God is about to happen. And what are they? I'm not going to turn the references up. I'm just going to give you a few pointers to show you what the Bible says. And it's a time when Israeli people will return to their own land. Ezekiel chapter 37, Luke chapter 31. When Israel becomes one nation again in their own land on quote, the mountains of Israel. That's the West Bank area. When Jerusalem is once more in Israeli hands. Luke chapter 21. When the nations of the world are in deep trouble. Matthew chapter 24 and again, Luke chapter 21. When people on earth no longer have respect for God, they don't have godly ways, they look for pleasure continually, they commit crime, they disappear, disobey authority, and much, much worse, says the Apostle Paul in 2 Timothy chapter 3. And finally, and with this reference we will bring our thoughts to a conclusion, it's 1 Corinthians 15. Because we said... That Jesus won't just suddenly zap the world and all the troubles have gone away. It will take time. But the problems all began when Adam and Eve sinned and did what God told them they were not to do. And it's Paul in this chapter tells us the result of that and the result of what Jesus accomplished and what he will accomplish in the future. And we'll conclude with these verses because I see my time has gone and I had set them myself to sit down at 22 Four, so uh, that's just about right. Verse 22, For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive, but every man in his own order. Christ the firstfruits, afterward they that are Christ's at his coming. Then cometh the end, when he shall have delivered up the kingdom to God, even the Father, when he shall have put down all rule and all authority and power. For he must reign till he has put all enemies under his feet. 
And the last enemy that should be destroyed is death. For he hath put all things under his feet. But when he says all things are put under his feet, it is manifest that he is accepted which did put all things under him. And when all things shall be subdued unto him, then shall the Son, that is Jesus, also himself be subject unto him that put all things under him, that God may be all and in all. And that is the hope that we have for the future. A time when Jesus will return, and then over a period of time will bring this world back to peace and righteousness and holiness. And then Jesus himself, as the king, will hand his kingdom over to his father. And then human suffering will finally have its ultimate end. And for eternity, this planet and all creation will give glory to the God who made it.